Hi everybody, welcome back to Lab Hours. Today we're doing the Continuous Joint Distributions mini lecture. Now if you watched the one from yesterday, it was big and long, but because yesterday's was really long, uh, today's can be really short and quick. You might have noticed as well that this Tommy triple right here, the joint and marginal distributions, the covariance and the correlation, they look exactly the same as when we did uh, it's back a little ways, but they look exactly the same as when we first introduced correlation. Because this was the first time that we introduced like joint distributions, where you could have probability distributions that had more than one variable in them. We're back to that now, but instead of doing it in the discrete case, we are now into the continuous case as we established yesterday. If you haven't watched yesterday's, this one might be a little bit difficult to pick up on, but Let's just go ahead and jump right into it. We're going to talk about today joint and marginal distributions, covariance, correlation, but in the continuous world now, the world of continuous variables. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. Uh, we know from last time, I'm actually going to pull one of our valid densities from last time really quick. Um, we know from last time that there was this like 2x thing, this density right here, this PDF, right? And we sort of drew it out, the graph is like a histogram, and we figured out how to make sure that it integrates to 1 so that it covers 100% of all possibilities and stuff like that. But now we're going to move into the world where we're not just looking at one variable, maybe distance that you live from the Westview building if you're catching, you know, from what we did last time. Again, I'm really going to recommend that you watch that one, or this one's going to be uh, not very helpful, I worry. Uh, unless you went to lecture, of course, in which case you're totally fine. You'll have the concepts. Uh, this f of x is equal to 2x for x is uh, between 0 and 1, anywhere between 0 and 1. We know was legitimate because we integrated it over its bounds from 0 to 1. Uh, and we found that that turns into, you know, x squared, which turns into, you know, 1 squared minus 0 squared, which turns into 1. That integrates totally legit. Uh, the exact same concept is going to apply here for our you know, our joint distributions, right? So let's talk about maybe some distribution little f of x and y is going to be equal to, I don't know, let's say there's some constant k, or maybe you could call it star or c or whatever. Uh, but the way that x and y relate is that you have x squared and y, right? So however much y there is, the x is squared or something like that. This is what the function looks like. For Let's just give it, you know, x and y are both between 0 and 1, something like that. If I were to try to graph this like we did last time in terms of like a histogram, you'd actually have to do like a little 3D graph thing where like you have x's over here and you have like y's coming down this way and they'd be like something like this in like big rectangle cube prism looking things. So we're going to skip that. And we're just going to say, take all of the intuition that we talked about yesterday, and now we're just doing it with two variables. That's it. It's, it's really not any more complicated than that, other than we have to do everything twice, basically. So how would I make sure that this density, this joint continuous, like this joint, right, because there's two variables, joint, continuous, because it's not just 0 or 1. They can be anywhere between 0 and 1. How do I make sure that this joint continuous density function or probability density function is legitimate. Well, I need to pick some number, some scaling factor so that I know this will integrate to 1. So let's just do that really quick as a refresher, right? Let's go ahead. I'm going to have to integrate both x squared and y for this one. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's integrate both x and y over the bounds. They both have the bounds 0 to 1, so that's nice. I get to pick which order I'm doing this in kx squared y, uh, let's, do, let's do y first, just for fun, you know, dy dx, right? And I need this, in order for this to be legitimate, to be an actual probability density function, I need this, when it's integrated, to add up to 1, okay? It needs to cover 100% of all the possible outcomes, otherwise, I could throw a dart at this dartboard that, you know, maybe looks something like this gradient over here, and it might land in this corner, and I'd be like, okay, what's the value? And it'd be like, oh, there's no value. What the heck? So again, that's why this is integrating to 1. So we'll just leave this equals 1 here the whole time. Easy peasy, right? Let's go ahead and integrate this in terms of y. We're going to leave the uh, x1, x1. We're going to leave the x integral on the outside while we're doing this. 
The antiderivative of kx squared y uh, in terms of y means that we're only looking at y as a variable. Of course, this is just going to be a little quick review of the double integral, right? x is normally a variable because it's in this function, but when we're integrating with respect to y, we hold x constant and treat it as a constant, so that makes our lives a little bit easier. This antiderivative is equal to 1 half k x squared y squared. You know, we take the y, we pull up a constant, so it goes from y1 to y2, and then we uh, pull that from this denominator here. Easy peasy, right? We're going to evaluate that from 1 to 0, dx is equal to 1. So we get that the integral from 0 equals x to 1 of, if I plug in 1 here, y turns into 1, right? If I plug in this 1, y squared is 1, so it will just leave this. And then if I plug in 0, this all goes away. So I'm going to skip the step here, but this turns into 1 half k x squared dx still is equal to 1. Now we just got to finish out the integral by doing the x step. Nothing too crazy here. Uh, the antiderivative of 1 half kx squared, we're going to pull this up to be from a 2 to a 3. So we need to pull a 3 from out from under this denominator. That means instead of 1 half, it's going to turn into 1 sixth. So let's go ahead and write that. The antiderivative is 1 sixth kx to the third. We evaluate it at its bounds, 1 to 0, and we need to set that equal to 1. Uh, similarly to the last time, when we take this 1 here and plug it in, 1 cubed is going to turn into 1, so it'll just leave us with 1 sixth k, and then 0 will cancel the whole thing out. So we are left with 1 sixth k is equal to 1, or that k needs to be equal to 6, right? So in order for a probability density function of this kind of structure, this x squared y, for these bounds to be legitimate, right, we need to do the following. We need to make this k into a 6. So let's do that. Now what could this reasonably look like, right? Well maybe we're thinking about y as our variable from last time, you know, the distance between uh, the Westview building and where someone lives, where someone like me who lives at the Westview building basically is going to be on this zero end and somebody who lives an hour from the Westview building is going to be over on this end and there's a bunch of people scattered in between. Y could be like number of people that far away from the Westview building, right? And maybe uh, the Y is sort of constant in a line, like here's the building and then there's just person, 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 person in a line, right? and they're evenly spaced. That's why the y would be linear there. But maybe the x squared is like number of restaurants uh, within an hour of the Westview building because within zero minutes of the Westview building there aren't any, right? And a couple minutes is like the cougary, but for the most part every restaurant is actually going to be way farther away. They're going to be more heavily concentrated towards here and so that density will kind of look like this, right? Like when I'm close on the x side, there's not as many restaurants. But when I get farther away, there's a lot more restaurants, right? So that's something that that could look like, a little bit of that intuition. So now that we've done this math and thought through this, we know that this 6 is meaningless, except that it makes it integrate to 1, so it covers all of the restaurants and people who live or exist within an hour of the Westview building, something like that, right? Restaurants, people, we're looking at both within an hour, uh, and this 6 is only here to make the math correct. That's what it does. So now our joint probability density function is legitimate. That's great. But sometimes we're only going to be worried about looking at one of the variables, right? So let's take a look at that. How would I get something like the expected value of just x squared, right? Maybe I have this function because my data gave me data on people and restaurants. Uh, but maybe I'm only interested in restaurants and their distance from the Westview building. So how would I deal with that? Well, just like we did before with our marginal distributions, right? I'll pull back here a couple pages so you can kind of see what we did with our marginal distributions, right? We had this big setup where like for each specific combination of values, they had their own specific probability. But now it's impossible to make this list of combinations because Zero, like x can take on infinite values between 0 and 1 and so can y. So this list would have to be like friggin just 
infinitely long, and I don't have enough tablet for that, right? But what we did is we just took a look at the values of a and where they changed, and we just took a look at the values of k and where they changed. And what we did is we said, let's ignore the change in a if we want to get the probabilities for k, right? Even if this a is different, let's ignore that for a second and just look at where k is the same. That's exactly what we're going to do to get marginal densities from this joint density that we know is legitimate now, right? And if we know, right, if we're doing this right, I'm actually just going to scroll like this because it makes it a little bit easier. I don't have to do as much scrolling. We should also know if we're going to do this on a continuous, uh, in the continuous world, that when we do find these marginal densities, they should also integrate to 1, just like these marginal distributions added up to 1 after we took the margins, right? Boom, 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 and there they went, right? So we should know once we find these marginal density functions, they should uh, intuitively also sort of integrate to 1. Just because we're going to integrate one of the other variables out, we're going to account for how it affects the other variable so that we can ignore it, basically. Right? If we were to draw the graph, right, the, you know, the xy graph, uh, maybe x looks like this if you just projected it onto here. And maybe y goes like this. And y could maybe look like that if you just projected it onto you know, this sort of axis right here. But x looks like this, you know. Something like that, right? We're only going to look at one variable at a time. But we also have to account for like how this variable changing might change the shape of the projection, which is kind of cool. A little bit um, mathy, a little bit picture-y. So let's just do it really quick. If I wanted to find the marginal density of x, which we're going to denote with this little fx down here, the reason we have this little sub x down here is to remind us that this is coming from a joint distribution. Uh, and just to be like, yeah, we have the specific part of the function that has to deal with x of x because the whole function f deals with both x and y. Nothing crazy like that, just a little bit of notation. It's just like px of x is equal to x, right, from before. So let's jump right into that. What we're going to do is we're going to integrate across the bounds of y and, and just get y out of the picture so that we can account for its effects on this legitimate function and then just have a picture of how x moves by itself when we don't have to worry about y, right? So let's go ahead and do that, OK? Let's go ahead and do it. Integrate from 0 to 1 is equal to y, right? 6x squared y dy. That's all we're doing. We're just going to account for all of the things that y does to this equation, right? Because like at x is 0, you know, y could be, I mean, x is 0 is a bad example, but at x, at x is equal to 1, you know, y can take on a value anywhere from 0 to 1. So we want to account for all that and just get an idea of what this looks like. Pardon. Let's go ahead and do that. The antiderivative of this is going to be, we're going to pull the 1 half from over here outside of the y, so that this can be y squared, right? And so that will turn into 3x squared y squared evaluated from 1 to 0, which we know from before. This y squared is going to turn into 1 squared, and then it's also going to turn into 0 squared, and we're going to subtract that one. So we get just plain old 3x squared for x is, you know, some number between 0 and 1. And we can go ahead and double check and see, does this integrate to 1? Well, the nice thing is, if we were to take this antiderivative, that turns into um, just x cubed evaluated from 1 to 0, which is nice, because we'll pull the 3 from over here to make this cubed, and 3 over 3 is 1. Easy peasy. So we know that it's legitimate, and we can do the same thing really quickly for y. What would fy of y be? Well, that would be equal to, we just integrate the x out. And you'd normally write like x is equal to 0 to 1, but what can you do, right? Of the original thing, right? So integrate the x out of the original joint PDF so we can get the marginal density of y, right? Let's go ahead and try that. That antiderivative, we're going to pull the 3 from down here to turn this 2 into a 3. 6 thirds is equal to 2, right? So we get 2x cubed y, because we're treating y as a, 
as a constant because we're integrating in terms of x, easy peasy, right? And that is going to be evaluated from 0 to 1, and so that is going to give us this x cubed is going to turn into 1 cubed, and it will also turn into 0 cubed in the version that gets subtracted. So this is going to cancel, and it just turns into 2y for y is a number between 0 to 1. And hopefully you can see that that would also integrate to 1 over those bounds. These are two legitimate marginal distributions. Now the question is, like, what is actually the use of doing this? Well, just like we did before, we're going to use these marginal distributions and this together distribution in order to calculate some really important statistics, right? Let's go ahead and check off joint and marginal distributions from the Tommy triple, and we're going to head right back into covariance. Before we do that, though, I want to point out from last time this rule and this move that we made from adding up the thing times the probability of that thing to integrating over the bounds the thing times the function, the PDF function of that thing, right? This is going to be no different except that we have added another variable. So if I wanted to get the covariance of x and y given this legitimate PDF right here, this legitimate probability density function that we have, what would I do? Well, I know that covariance is equal to the expected value of xy minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. That's just the formula for it, right? And I now have all the pieces to get this, actually. I would just use this marginal density to get e of x, because all I'd have to do is I'd have to integrate over the bounds of the thing times the probability of the thing. Or in this case, that would be the bounds 0 to 1 of x times fx of x, right? And it'll be the same thing for y, you know, parallel, right, for y. So over here, if I wanted to get e of x, y, what would I do? Well, the probability of getting any specific combination of x's and y's is represented by this joint probability function, you know, this joint density function. So all I have to do to get e of x, y, pretty simple, e of x, y is going to be the integral over the bounds of the things, right? And this time we'll write it in the correct order. Let's do x second again, right? The integral over the bounds of the thing, which in this case involves both x and y, of the thing, which is x, y, times the probability of seeing that thing, or in this case, the legitimate PDF, right? So that would be 6x squared y. And then we were doing y first, because it's on the inside, right? y to x, so let's do y first. Okay, this one's going to be a little bit more obnoxious, but we'll work through it together, right, pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to leave the integral from x equals 0 to 1 on the outside, and the first thing I want you to do is actually to just distribute this. Do not try to integrate this with some kind of reverse product rule or anything like that. Just multiply the numbers through. It makes your life way better, right? So this turns into 6x cubed y squared dy dx. Let's keep going with that really quick. Uh, the first integral stays on the outside. That's great. But now we can take the antiderivative in terms of y. We're going to take a 3 from down here and put it up here, right? So that's going to turn into 2x cubed y cubed evaluated from y equals 1 to 0, right? And then we'll still have the dx on the outside because we haven't done that derivative yet. And let's go ahead and just write this out, right? Once I take the 1 in here, this will turn into 1 cubed version of this minus the 0 cubed version of this. So the 0 cubed version goes away. The 1 cubed will get rid of this y here. And we will get the integral from x equals 1 to 0 of 2x cubed dx. We're still not done yet. We have to finish up this second integral. So let's go ahead and do that. We can take this antiderivative. We're going to pull, a, not a 3, but we're going to pull a 4 from the bottom here and put it up top with the x. So let's go ahead and do that. For the antiderivative, we have 1 half x to the fourth evaluated from 1 to 0, which hopefully at this point you can see is going to be equal to 1 half. So what is the expected value of x times y? Given this probability density function, on average, x times y is going to be equal to 1 half. Great stuff. Um, what I'm not going to do really, well, maybe I will because I'm already recording. Might as well, right? Let's find the expected value of x and the expected value of y. 
right? And then just uh, go from there. So if I just find the expected value of x really quick, that would be equal to what? Well, it's the over the bounds of the thing, x equals 0 to 1, of the thing, which in this case is just x, times the probability of that thing, which in this case is just the marginal one, right? This is why the marginal distribution is helpful, is because we don't have to deal with reintegrating the y out. We can just work directly from here, this 3x squared, right? So x times 3x squared dx. This is the integral. The thing times the probability of that thing over the bounds of the thing, dx. D the thing, if you will. <laughs> just really quickly, I'm not going to work through this too fast, but this is going to be 3x cubed. Antiderivative is going to be 3 fourths x to the fourth. It's going to evaluate from 1 to 0, which means we are going to get a number 3 fourths. And then the expected value of y, very much a similar story. This is going to be y equals 0 to 1 of y times 2y dy. And that is going to be equal to um, 2y squared is going to turn into 2 thirds y cubed evaluated from 1 to 0, which is going to turn into 2 thirds. So the covariance of x and y in this case is going to be equal to 1 half, which was the expected value of x, y, right, from this part right here, minus 3 fourths, which was the expected value of x, times 2 thirds. That's a really bad 3 right there, but 2 thirds, right? Uh, that's going to be equal to 1 half minus 3 fourths of 2 thirds is equal to 2 fourths, which is actually 1 half. So these two things actually do not covary at all. Pretty cool. Uh, wasn't planning that, right? Because, you know, that turned those two cancel. 2 and 4 simplifies to 1 half. So what does this mean? Uh, the covariance of x and y is actually 0. That means x and y do not move together at all, which is pretty nifty. Um, one thing that that tells us is that we might want to be looking out for whether these variables are independent or not, right? If I see a zero covariance, it doesn't necessarily always tell me that they're independent, but it tells me I should check if they're independent. And how would I do that? Well, just like we did back in the day, we want to know uh, if taking the probability of x times the probability of y is the same as the probability of x and y together for all the values of x and y. In the past, when we gave you tables, you would have had to actually check every single value of x times y. But now that we have functions, we can actually just multiply these two things together and see if it equals this, right? And in this case, it actually turns out that if f of x, y is equal to f x of x times f y of y, then they're independent. And in this case, they do happen to be independent, which is cool because 6x squared y is equal to 3x squared times 2y. So that's pretty cool. Didn't even mean to do that, but it's pretty interesting, right? That's how you'd calculate covariance, right? And in this case, we can just call that done for covariance, right? You can see how you would do, because the because the really important thing is just getting, how do I get this e of x, y? Well, integral of over the bounds of the thing, which all parts of the thing, right? Of the thing times the probability of that thing, right? And the probability of that thing is the probability density function of that thing, right? In this case, x and y, any form of x and y, right? <laughs> If you wanted to find the correlation, you actually do have all of the tools to do that. You would just have to find things like standard deviation of x, which would be equal to the expected value of x squared minus, well, it'd be the square root of the expected value of x squared minus the squared expected value of x, right? Of course, we know that from before. That's a formula that we're familiar with. And just to write that out for you so that you'd have all the tools, of course, correlation would look like this, covariance of x and y, which we just found was 0 over, you know, COVID, standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. Great stuff. This standard deviation of x in this format, and I'll leave the rest of you to try as an exercise because I promised a short one and it went a little bit long because we worked out all the math and stuff. But what this would look like is it would look like the following. The standard deviation of x is going to be equal to the square root of, I'm going to give myself lots of space, right? The integral over the bounds of the thing, in this case 0 to 1, of 
the thing squared, right? Because this is the thing, right? So it's not even the thing squared. This is literally just the thing in the parentheses, in this case, x squared, times the probability of that thing, which in this case is the marginal density of x, or this 3x squared from before, right? x squared times 3x squared dx minus parentheses the integral over the bounds of the thing, 0 to 1, of the thing, which in this case is just x, times the probability of that thing, 3x squared. That hasn't changed, right? Because this x squared, if I find that my x squared is 9, my x will be 3. And the probability of those two things showing up, if I have x equal to 3 and x squared equal to 9, uh, those probabilities are the same, right? Because if x is 3, then x squared has to be 9, right? So that's pretty cool, especially because in this world, uh, we're in a standard deviation world where it's non-negative, right? So this would be the integral of the thing, right, x times the probability of that thing, 3x squared, over the bounds of that thing. And then we're going to take that quantity squared, right? Because that's from this formula up here. This is how you'd set it up. And I will just leave you to go ahead and be able to do that if you'd like. Um, nothing too crazy here, OK? That's going to cover everything that we needed to do from uh, correlation. And in fact, I've been drawing these in the wrong color. That's no good. But that's going to actually cover the Tommy Triple Four continuous joint distributions mini. Most of today was actually just working through the math to give you a, a just kind of a helpful insight on how we do these double integrals and how they make sense, right? Not so much intuition today, but actually just a little bit of practice. So I think that can be helpful from time to time. Today we covered the idea of joint and marginal uh, continuous distributions and how they work as functions instead of being discrete now. Uh, we talked about calculating the covariance, how I would do expected value of x, y in this case. Again, it's just another instance of the thing times the probability of the thing over the bounds of that thing, including all parts of that thing, right? I, I know you might get tired of hearing me say that, but that idea is really going to be super essential to, the, to your stats and metrics classes coming up forward, right? And then I just left you a fun little exercise for correlation. Hopefully, you can tell that with this example, because covariance of x and y is 0, the correlation would also be zero. Uh, but this is the general format of how you do it. And you know, we also found our little constant k to or c or whatever we called it so that we could make sure that our joint distribution was legitimate, right? That's all we needed to cover today. It's just take all of the ideas we've already covered and instead of just numbers, x is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, now it's a function. It can be anything from 0 to 6. It could be pi for all I care. Just don't call me late for it, right? Uh, next time you come into the lab, hopefully when you come by, we're going to talk about continuous conditional distributions, which again is going to be hopefully a little bit of a shorter one. But you know, if today's is any example, it will probably just be more math walkthrough, right? Because it's the exact same idea as when we previously did conditional distributions, but this time uh, we're going to be doing it with uh, the continuous versions, right? It's not discrete anymore. So as always, thanks for stopping by. If you've got questions and you're in the class, uh, email tmorg.ta at gmail.com. And if you're not in the class, email labhours at tmorg.org. Of course, if you want to keep seeing these when they come out, you go ahead and subscribe and like the video and ask questions in the comments, and you know what to do. It's great stuff. And uh, we'll see you around next time when we talk about the continuous conditional distributions mini lecture. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.